Growing up in a Minneapolis suburb, Eric Swanson has spent his life engrossed in stories with a wide scope. From being frightened by Stephen King's It to being enthralled by Orson Scott Card's Ender Wiggins stories, the written word of others has grabbed Eric and often refused to let go. Many of his favourite novels have been read multiple times. From an early age, Eric was a fan of all things science fiction, with a leaning towards the dystopian and post-apocalyptic. The future fascinates Eric no end, be that a realistic or a wild-eyed and far-fetched future. While he annually binges on Battlestar Galactica 4, he dreams of worlds, people and happenings yet to be written. Eric lives in Austin, Texas, with his wife, two children and a pair of golden doodles. His first novel, Micah Trace and the Shattered Gate, is a science fiction epic and the first in series. And in today's episode, he tells me all about it. So uh, let's get in and listen to what he has to say. Welcome to the Turning Readers into Writers podcast, where we teach beginner writers how to find the time and the confidence to write their first novel. I'm your host, Emma Desi, and I'm very excited that you're here. Thank you for joining me today, because if you've been longing to write your novel for forever, then this is the place to be. Think of this as your weekly dose of encouragement, of handholding and general cheerleading as you figure out how you're going to write your first novel. Trust me, as a mum of three young kids, I know how tricky it can be to tuck some time aside for yourself on a regular basis. And even when you do find that spare five minutes, you can feel so overwhelmed that no writing gets done. Trust me, I have been there, but this podcast is going to help you in practical ways because once a week I'll be delivering an episode that gives you steps to building a writing routine, encouragement to build your confidence and cheerleading until you reach the end. Okay, let's start. Well, fantastic, Eric. Thank you so much um, for joining me today. I really appreciate your time. Of course. I wonder if you could start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be a writer. (laughs) Um, I'm sure you it happened very much by accident, (laughs) Um, but it's, it's been something I've been interested in my entire life. Um, I always, I joke with my mother all the time that the the first story I wrote when I was 10 years old, um, I sat down and wrote a story about a bunch of my friends playing on a baseball team. And it, it went from, you know, a couple page story to, I ended up filling six spiral notebooks with this story. Yeah. And, you know, again, it, I don't know if it was any good (laughs) because I was 10, but that, that sort of itch to create sort of always, it was there. It was always there. I think everybody's life, Emma, asks them a question, right? And I think people don't necessarily struggle finding the answer. I think people struggle with the first part is figuring out what that question is. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm married. I've got two kids. They're uh, in high school now, which is mind blowing. Um, but, you know, the, the writing thing has always been something I've been interested in. It's always been something that I suppose I've been somewhat good at. Um, and this has given me an opportunity to, sort of use those skills to get a story out there that I I think will resonate with people once I'm able to actually, you know, really market it. I, I know I've got a couple things going from a marketing perspective, but really to this point, my sales have been, you know, friends and family. Mm-hmm. Well, that's because so. we've all got to start somewhere, isn't it? And I think um, it's such a brave thing and not something that everybody does is even just to press publish to take that deep breath, have that faith in yourself and go for it. And, you know, we're all, I think all of us are always nervous about doing it the first time because it's it's huge and we've told our friends and family about it. And and of course, we always want people to like it. But um, so, you know, just being able to press publish, I think, is a a huge, huge step forward. And it's just the beginning of the journey. Well, yeah, that's that's absolutely true. Um, I can actually empathize with, that uh, we'll call it button fear, right? <laughs> Literally like sitting with my hand over the button thinking, should I really do this? Um, 
you know, I've got 12 reviews so far, um, 11 fives and one four star on Amazon, which is great. Um, three of them are actually from people I don't know, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> Even nicer, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> right, right. Um, but no, it, it's so, there is a lot of fear to it, especially if it's not an impersonal story. You know, because there's a lot of, I mean, obviously the story is sci-fi oriented, so it doesn't really apply to much of my life. But the themes are, I think, sort of evergreen, mm -hmm. to steal a phrase. Universe, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so how long did it take you to write this first book of yours? Um, between starting and, and actually writing the last word in the first draft, it was about a year and a half. Well, that's good. You made good progress yeah. then. You, could, you sat down and said, I'm doing it. Well, so so you'd asked earlier about the the whole philosophy and and syntax of writing a series, and what I did is I sat down and started outlining the first story, and it wasn't until I was done outlining what I thought was the first story that I realized that that wasn't the first story; that was the first two stories. And then, as I started thinking about what I wanted to do with the books, just in terms of the story and, and themes and the character development. Um, this image popped into my head of what will end up being the last scene of the sixth book. And so I've, you know, begin with the end in mind. So does that mean that you have, you've planned out the all six now, so you know what's gonna happen in, in all six in series? <laughs> So I'm, I'm actually a hundred pages into the third book right now, writing it. Um, I know exactly what's going to happen stem to stern in books three and four and books five and six, I have high level outlined. Okay. And in your series does, um, is there an overarching storyline that covers them all or mm -hmm. is each one not standalone, but can be read independently of the others? No, they're serialized. Okay. Okay. This is such a, I, I'm always in such admiration of people who can do that, who can have that big overarching uh, plot line and then those smaller ones in each book as well. Well, that's been one of the, one of the struggles is sort of, and I'm, I know I say this as someone who's, you know, only sold a couple hundred copies of a book. So like, who, who the heck am I? But um, I think one of the things that really successful authors struggle with sometimes is tending that garden in that you start telling this story. And I think as authors, we're inclined to think that every aspect of our story is beautiful and compelling and, and, and it's going to hook people. So I think what, what happens sometimes is that the garden tends to get overgrown mm -hmm. and you have too many characters and too many places and too many things going on. So I've tried to balance introducing new characters over the course of the second and third books. And some of the, some of it is by nature of the story that, you know, moving from one world to another, you have to introduce a lot, mm -hmm. but, but I've tried to be mindful of that because some of my favorite books, um, they're great, but you get to the point where there's sort of a war and peace chapter. And it's all about this one character that you meet for five minutes and then they're gone. And I just, I was trying to avoid having too many points of focus. Mm -hmm. I remember talking to another author as well, Annie Thompson, and she was saying that one of the wonderful things actually about writing a series is if you discover a character that you love, you don't need to squeeze them into that first or second book. In fact, you can bring them in later on down the line, maybe the third or fourth book, because you know you've got all the space to play with. And so you don't need to let go of those characters necessarily, um, but you can slot them in at another time. and. As someone who only writes standalone, I, I had a bit of envy there because I thought, yeah, that, that must be nice to know that you've got that room to play with. Yeah, th there are actually a couple characters. There are two specifically that come to mind that are in the first book that don't appear until the third. See. And they're so, so, and then, then the state of the characters changes meaningfully between that, those two points in time. Uh, and then I've got and this is sort of a, a sickness, right? But as I've been writing, as the universe has kind of developed in the books, 
you know, um, characters will mention historical happenings. Right. And as in writing, I'll, I'll start writing about, you know, them just mentioning this thing happening, whether it's, you know, a year ago, 50 years ago, or in the far flung history in the universe. And I'll, I'll take that chunk and say, you know what, I, at some point I want to write more about that. So I have another 14 stories that take place at some point in the universe where that sort of that lightning bolt hit me. And I was like that, I want to talk about that. And now, talking of, of universe um, something else that I, I admire about people who write sci-fi or fantasy is that, that element of world building or universe mm -hmm. building. And so for you with this series, how have you gone about creating this, this new world? Is it something that you planned beforehand, something that's been in your mind for the last 10 years, or is it something you've sat down and strategically worked out? Uh, so I, I know there's the, uh, what's the, what are the phrases? Panther and plotter. Mm. I'm a weird hybrid of, of the two in that, I, I, are you familiar with Final Draft? No. It's a screenwriting software. Ah, okay. We don't need to promote it too heavily here, but there's a function in the program that allows you to build like a beat board almost. Okay. Right? And so what I do is I use that to outline the stories. Uh-huh. And that's, that's where all the outlining, all the character arcs are outlined, where all the broader story beats are outlined. Um, and then where eventually I start actually outlining, you know, individual happening, happenings as I'm trying to tell the story. Uh -huh. So I think the outline is probably the equivalent of, I don't know, 60 or 70 pages. Okay. Which, which isn't huge, but, you know. That's pretty hefty. <laughs> mm, yeah. I mean, it's, it's so basically what I do is I, I come up with bullets for each of the scenes and then I just start writing. So it's, it's like half plotter, half pantser. Okay. Um, I, you know, I'm not really writing. I'm not plotting out anything like down to the word or down to the paragraph, but it's here are two or three lines about what I want to accomplish in the scene, you know, how I want to move the story forward. And then I sit down and start writing. Fantastic. And it's quite it's quite useful to have that, even just having those bullet points, because then it just gives you a little bit of focus, a few signposts along the way to help you keep on track. But I'm right. also interested though, kind of the idea of, you know, um of place names, of people names, of vehicles, transport, spaceships, um, whatever else that might be in this world that you've created, or even okay. languages or um jobs and that kind of thing. Do you are those things that come to you as you're writing or are those things that you have, you've developed beforehand? I, I would say that the concepts for the most part have been developed beforehand. Um, in a lot of cases, uh, character names, location names, they sort of, as I'm writing, I'll sort of get a feeling for a character or a place or a thing and in a lot of cases, what I'll do is I'll take a a word that I think defines that person, that character, that whatever, and then I'll start looking for translations in different languages of that same word. Oh. And then I'll sort of bastardize the word, right, to just turn it a little bit from a, a phonetic perspective or make it a little easier to read. And um, I use that. Oh, cool. I like that idea. That's really nice. Um, yeah. You've still got the essence of the character or, or the place, but a really unique twist on it. I like that. Yeah. Well, so look, I'll give you an example. Um, in in the story, uh, I I invented a sport that's sort of this. So that I think there are things. I'm going to back up for a second. I think there are things that sort of define societies, right? So the things that define societies are their faith or lack thereof, right? Depending on what society we're talking about. Sports, politics, and media. So I, I think you can learn a lot about a society by watching their entertainment, <laughs> by getting a sense for, you know, what they do to pass the time, how they talk to each other, how they legislate, how all of that. So 
the way I've introduced this alien world and then the way in the second book I'll introduce the second planet, uh, it's through those lenses. It's, it's through the political lens. It's through the entertainment lens. It's through the religious or faith-oriented lens. Um, and so I created a sport for the story. And the sport in the book is called Antisar, which is a, a sort of mucked around version of the word for victory in Arabic. I like it. That's clever. So, it just you know, it, it's um, it's just something I've had a lot of fun with. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. So I'm, not, I'm kind of like with your um, your plotting. It's a bit of a hybrid. So some of the things you have thought about beforehand, perhaps they've been kind of mulling around there in the back of your brain for a while. Mm-hmm. And then other things are kind of more in- instinctive and arise as you're writing and. And it's something that feels right for that mm-hmm. place or that character. I like that. Now, when you are writing, um, how do you balance that out? Having that writing time that you need, balancing that out with, I don't know if you have a, a day job, but I know you've got a family. So how do you yeah. balance all those out? Um, it's incredibly difficult. Um, you know, I, frankly, uh, it, it's sometimes almost impossible. And I think, uh, I think, especially given the world we live in right now, right, um, the the side hustles, the the passion projects, um, if they're not bringing in meaningful income, right, you, you you've got to focus on what is. So you know, and and I, frankly, um, one of the things that's been tough about this period is trying to balance, you know. <laughs> keeping the the full time job plate spinning, making sure that you know I'm knocking the cover off the ball there, so to speak, so that you know things are stable, mm-hmm. and then finding time for everything else. And right now, yeah, writing is one of those everything else's. But unfortunately, just by virtue of the world we live in and kind of the circumstance we're faced with right now, um, it's it's not at the top of the list. Okay, I should just point out for anybody listening in the future that um, um, Eric and I are recording this in October 2020, and so we're still kind of in the the height of the coronavirus pandemic, and everything is a bit crazy this year in 2020. So just to put that in a bit of perspective for anyone listening in the future, yeah, yeah, I know I can totally understand that. I think even um, listening to interviews with professional writers or full time writers just having schools closed down, everything being changed, even though our profession is is very home-based or very sort of insular, it's just as it still throws everyone for a loop. It's still mentally is quite a rejig of things, isn't it? It is. It is. And it's 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 a tough thing to balance. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, in in a lot of cases almost impossible. <laughs> so like I, I think what's important people who maybe find less time than others do to write. I think the key is it's two things in my mind. It's a, don't feel bad about that. I think it's really easy to sort of, let's say, take a break unintentionally from writing your story. And I think some people get a little more disappointed by those breaks than they should. And so maybe sometimes it's, well, so maybe sometimes they get they get sort of wrapped up in the idea that uh, oh I, I wanted to have you know twenty thousand words written by this date and I've got twelve right okay. right and there's this there's this sort of defeatist mindset that I think can kind of weigh on you as you're writing and that can it can come through in the voice so just I guess if I were to give anybody advice I would say you know write as your life allows and don't don't feel bad when your life doesn't allow that to be you know two hours every day exactly because, well, I totally agree yeah you got to yeah, give yourself which, a bit of grace sometimes life life has a way of throwing a curveball every now and again or an entire year of curveballs <laughs> yes. so in a kind of normal year a normal time um when you do sit down to write, do you tend to have a goal for each writing session? Is it maybe a set period of time or a word count? I don't. I should, but I don't. Um, you know, I, I think that's something that, that that's something I've always 
considered establishing, you know, saying, Hey, if I'm going to sit down and write, it's going to be for, you know, an hour and I'm going to do, I don't know, 1500 words, right. 2000 good words, something like that. But again, I think that if I set really strict goals on myself for the hour that I can steal to do that, I just, I feel like if I don't hit that number, even if it's a great 750 words, I'm still going to be disappointed by it. Okay. And so I, so I try not to set a, a word count goal more so just, you know, can I find half an hour? Can I find, you know, 45 minutes? Can I knock out, you know, maybe this one beat that's been sort of bouncing around in my head like a pinball, that kind of thing. Okay, cool. So that, giving yourself that flexibility that you need around everything else. Now, you mentioned just some beats there. And before you mentioned uh, First Draft, the, the software First Draft. So is that um, you using First Draft again for the second book? Is that the, the sort of um, approach that you've taken? I wonder if you could tell us just a little bit more about the idea of the beats and how that works for you in your planning. Yeah. Yeah. So Emma, final, final draft is actually a screenwriting software. So it's a little bit, it's not, I don't think generally thought of as a, an author's tool, but um, essentially what it is, is basically there's a feature in the program that basically lets you build a, like a sticky board where you're basically putting post-it notes, digital post-it notes up and you can organize them, move them around, change colors, things like that. So you know, it allows you to organize thoughts. It allows you to organize character arcs. It allows you to organize, you know, all sorts of things. It is something that I'll be using for the foreseeable future. I mean, I, like I said, I've got the third book and fourth books fully outlined in that tool. And then I've got five and six sort of at a high level outlined. And then the other <laughs> dozen plus stories are, are sort of sketched out in separate documents in the same program. And so do you quite like that beat um, approach? Because I've used um, Jessica Brody's Save the Cat, which is also kind of derived from a screenwriting idea of using these different beats. Um, I find it very useful. I really like the way it was laid out. And that's something that seems kind of resonates with you as well, rather than having chapters and plot points, the idea of these different beats resonates. Yeah. Well, well and because, it, again, it's it's less about, the outlining is less about what's happening in the story and more about what I'm trying to convey. So in a lot of cases, it's like, I've had situations where as I've been writing, I've realized that a certain beat belongs earlier in the story or later in the story. So being able to sort of shift things around visually, it helps me to. On, on the program. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It helps me kind of straighten my mind out as I'm as I'm getting ready to write again. And do you tend to write quite linearly, or do you sort of jump in and out depending on what mood takes you? No, it's linear. Um, I I often wonder, like, you know, could I do that? Could I could I write the end and then come back? And I, I think because it's half plotter, half pantser, <laughs> I think if I wrote the end. And then wrote the middle piece. I think the middle piece would influence the end to the point where the end wouldn't. It would be the same, but there'd be elements that'd be different. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um. And so I wonder: is there anybody as well, apart from the first draft? Is there anybody that you kind of turn to uh, for sort of craft advice, or who particularly inspires you when it comes to writing? Sure. So um, in terms of advice, I actually um, have a, a small group of friends that are sort of like my beta reader group. Um, so you, I, I bounce things off them. Um, I've got a friend in California that was introduced to me by a, a mutual friend who, uh, you know, he, he's read chunks of it. Um, and then my, my parents actually as well have, uh, they were the first people to actually read the first two books end to end. Oh, right. um, and my mom is a writer. She was more technical, professional writing, but um, uh, you know, other than that, it's a, it's a small group of people that I trust to be honest with me. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I, 
it's always sort of a, okay, you know, read this and legitimately, if it's terrible, tell me. <laughs> um, I said rather no now. Uh, but no, I mean, you know, the, the feedback has been good. Um, the advice has been good. You know, there have been, uh, both my kids play hockey. So I write, I do a lot of writing in hockey ranks. Um, so there's, uh, occasionally in the draft, there'll be like weird typos <laughs> just because it's like, Oh, a puck hit the glass as I was typing. And I just kind of like, it reset my mind in a weird way. And I'm like, <laughs> no, it's, uh, it, it, it's good to have people that you can talk to about this stuff. Um, you know, a lot of the inspiration originally for the story came from uh, a TV show that a TV show and a couple of ideas that my wife and I were watching together a lot. So there's, you know, a bunch of different stuff I've bounced off of her. Um, it just, it, it all kind of meshes together mm -hmm. in a very weird, beautiful way. <laughs> so tell us about the series. Tell us about, um, well, tell us about the first book, first of all, uh, mm -hmm. the world that it's set in and, and who's in it. Sure. Sure. So the book is called Micah Trace and the Shattered Gate, and it actually starts on Earth about 35 years from now. And the idea is to sort of put the reader in this version of Earth that's a little bit further down the road. Some of the technology that we are thinking might pop up, some of the technology we may not want to pop up, um, you know, sort of throwing that out there. and then. Um, pretty quickly there's a, an abduction of about a hundred thousand humans very violently very publicly um and then then the story stops there and that's the first chapter is this this really traumatic very public abduction of tens of thousands of people so and so the i'm sorry straight into the action yeah, I, I think that's I think that's important in terms of hooking people. Um, the story jumps four centuries and actually takes place on another planet, and it's the planet that these hun these tens of thousands of humans were taken to, and uh, they were genetically altered in order to provide um, a resource pool for this alien race. Uh, the sun that their world orbits is older than ours. So the radiation from the sun is degrading their genome over time. And the only way to fix it, because they can't fix the star, is to patch their gene pool. So they're, they created this hybrid race of half human, half alien people as a, as a resource pool to patch that genome, you know, the, the broader genome. Um, so the story focuses on Micah Trace, who was genetically engineered to be the mimic or body double for the king of this alien world. So he looks exactly like the king, shares every aspect of his aesthetic. Um, but if everyone knows there is a body double, right, the value of that, that tool is sort of limited. So when he's in public, he wears a hood that hides his face. So he has the most famous face on the planet, but very, very few people know that it's his. And over the course of the earlier part of the story, he's in court, you know, listening to sort of the goings on of, of that world. And a couple travelers mention Earth. And he knows he's half human. He knows his, his story, so to speak. And they start talking about how, you know, Humanity is isolated, and they've basically built this incredible net of defensive technology around the planet. Because after that 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 taking happened, after that episode, the entire human race basically looks to the sky and to this jump gate that the aliens used to leave when they had everyone. But now that the gate at the end of that kidnapping, humanity nuked the gate and broke it. So the gate is, it's so big that they can't knock it out of orbit because if they do, it'll come down to earth in large chunks and kill millions, yak, yak, yak. 
So they've spent four centuries, humanity has, looking at this broken gate orbiting the planet. And so rather than like most traumas in human history, right, they fade because they're not right in front of your nose. Um, this just, it's, it's always there. It always, it's always reminding people of what happened. And out of fear, they've created this insular society. They've created sort of a, and this is more the second book, but that's what, that's what these travelers end up making Micah aware of is the, the plight of humanity. And so he's struck with this desire to go back to earth and yeah. And, and basically now that the, 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 the Royal family that runs the planet now, his planet is a little more benevolent than maybe the ones that, that had orchestrated that episode. Okay. So, so his goal is to go to earth, fix the gate, and help them understand that, you know, the rest of what's out there, which as far as they know is just their planet and earth. So it's not like most sci-fi where there are, you know, thousands of races and weird blue skin people and anything like that. Um, it's, it's really just those, those two planets. Okay. Well, it sounds very exciting. Lots of drama and tension there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now I know that you have quite a big month coming up soon because you've got a few releases. Do you want to tell us about those? Sure. So, yeah, within November at some point, you're going to see the second edition of the first book, which is Micah Trace and the Shattered Gate. Uh, a friend of mine that I actually met on LinkedIn um, did a couple uh, charcoal drawings for me. So I'm going to include those in the second edition of the first book. The second, the second book, which is called Micah Trace and the Two Worlds, that comes out along the same time, as well as the audio book for the first book. That is very exciting, getting your first audio book out there. Yeah, well, and it's funny, um, you know, Emma, most, most authors, when you start exploring the audio book idea, that gets expensive quickly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I don't know what it is about me or this process or the timing of it, but I, I keep running into people who, when I share with them what I'm doing, they say something to the effect of, well, I have this specific skill set or I have this specific whatever, and I'd like to help you. Wow. Serendipity. Serendipity. Yeah. So. Um, uh, just conscious of time, Eric. So I wonder sure. if, um, if you don't mind just letting people know where they can find out more about you and where they can get their, their hands on your book. Sure. So uh, the website that has a little bit of a, about me and a little bit about the books is eric-swanson.com. And then the book, Micah Trace and the Shattered Gate, is on Amazon exclusively right now. But at some point, it'll be a little more broadly available. Fantastic. That's lovely. Well, I'll be sure to put um, links in the show notes to both of those. Well, Eric, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you sharing uh, with us your experience of getting into writing, how tough it can be to balance all the things, but also mm -hmm. clearly the excitement and joy that you get from it as well. So thank you so much. Thank you. Before you go, I want to tell you about my Patreon page. Whenever anyone supports the show, it expresses just how much you're enjoying the content and how much you want it to continue. Your support helps maintain the podcast and keeps it going. It means I can create better resources for you when you're listening to the podcast or checking out the web page. It means I can focus on getting a higher reach of audience. And when we get a higher reach of audience, we can get more guests. Guests that are really going to help you. And then who knows where it'll go from there. As a new podcaster and someone who's starting out and finding their feet in the podcasting world, just as I'm helping you find your feet in the writing world, I can't do it alone. I always need help, so I'd love it if you would support the show by signing up. There's just one tier, $3 a month, and for that, I'll make sure that each week I'm delivering the best podcast I can for you. And as a way of saying thanks, I'll give you a personal shout out on the show. So check out the page at patreon.com forward slash Emma Desi. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Emma Desi. See you next time.